Hello everyone. A young man was an apprentice to an artist who produced the most beautiful stained glass windows. The apprentice, even after many months of training, could not detain the master's genius, so he borrowed the master's tools, thinking that was the answer. After several weeks, the apprentice said to the master, Master, I am not doing any better with your tools than I did with mine. The master replied, So, it is not the tools of the master you need, but the spirit of the master. It is not the tools of the master you need, but the spirit of the master. Friends, over 2000 years ago, Jesus' apostles had a similar experience. Before Jesus left the earth, he had instructed them, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teach them to observe all that I commanded you. I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Friends, though the apostles surely had willing hearts and Jesus' teachings, they were probably at your loss as to how to accomplish the work Jesus had given them to do. To be like Jesus, their master, and to carry out his mission on earth, they needed the spirit of Jesus. Today's readings tell us that they were indeed equipped with all the necessary means and more importantly, the same spirit that Jesus had in him to get the job done. Friends, from the Bible we learn that Jesus' arrest, conviction and death had left his apostles and followers confused, disappointed, disillusioned, frightened, hurt and in deep grief. But after three days, Jesus rose from the dead and appeared to them many times over a period of forty days and gave them many signs to show that he was alive. He also gave them the gifts of peace and joy and the mission to teach and baptize people and as well as the authority and power to forgive sins and above all the Holy Spirit and his presence. And finally, he appeared to them at Bethany and enjoined them to remain in Jerusalem to bear witness to him and then moved to all Judea and Samaria unto the ends of the earth. The apostles did as Jesus had commanded. They returned to Jerusalem and continued to gather in prayer and to praise and worship their exalted Lord and Master. Ten days later, that is fifty days after Jesus' resurrection, as usual, besides the apostles and followers of Jesus, Many others, particularly devout Jews from many regions and countries, were gathered in a house. They had not gathered to celebrate what we know as Pentecost, the commemoration of the descent of the Holy Spirit on their disciples. Rather, they had gathered together to observe Shavuot, one of the most solemn harvest festivals in the Old Testament times. It was also known to the Jews as the Feast of Weeks. Shavuot in Hebrew means weeks and it falls at the end of your week of weeks, that is seven weeks or 49 days after another feast called Bikurim, the feast of first fruits. Friends, harvest festivals are universal and the Israelite farmers probably celebrated their harvest festivals in ways not much different from others. However, by the time of Jesus, Shavuot had been transformed into something more than an agricultural celebration. From the time of their settlement in the Promised Land, they had been gathering to thank God not only for the harvest of their fields, orchards and vineyards, but also for the observations of the laws and traditions of the harvest which had developed from the time of Moses. Especially, they commemorated the revelation of the Torah or the law on Mount Sinai to the Jewish people. In the book of Exodus, we read that the Israelites left Egypt the day after the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread and went to Mount Sinai. On the 47th day after leaving Egypt, God called Moses up to the mountain to receive the law. On the fiftieth day, Moses returned with the law from God himself. This was the feast 
that God had commanded Israel to keep every year on the 50th day after the Passover. In Greek, it is called Pentecostus, transliterated into English Pentecost, that means 50th. Jews, mostly all able-bodied men from all over the ancient world of the Mediterranean, were expected to travel to Jerusalem to observe the harvest feast, including Shavuot. Friends, the Roman historian Cornelius Tacitus records that the population of Jerusalem was around 600,000 in the first century AD. He recounts that this population surged to 2 to 3 million during festivals. So, it is of course possible that on the day of Pentecost, the disciples, most of whom had been dispersed by tragic events that took place in their lives, had gathered again after Jesus' resurrection and ascension with the joy and renewed and fortified faith, also drew a large crowd who had come to Jerusalem for the festival. Luke points out that they were Parthians, Medes and Elamites, who were probably the inhabitants of the modern-day northern Iran and southern Iraq, people from Mesopotamia, which is mostly parts of modern-day Iran, Syria and Turkey, and Cappadocia, Pontus, Phrygia and Pamphylia, which are now called Turkey, as well as travelers from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism. Cretans from Greece and Arabs, probably from the Middle East or Northern Africa. The result of so many Jews and non-Jews gathering in Jerusalem for Shavuot or Pentecost was that 3,000 people became believers in Jesus and were baptized that day. So it was a gathering of both apostles and followers, preachers and listeners, believers and unbelievers friends, as they were probably talking with one another about Jesus. Luke writes, Suddenly there came from the sky a noise like a strong driving wind, and it filled the entire house in which they were. And there appeared to them tongues of fire, which parted and came to rest on each of them. Friends, in the Bible, the Holy Spirit is usually invisible and mysterious. However, at times he makes himself known in visible and tangible manifestations. For example, at Jesus' baptism in the Jordan, the Holy Spirit manifested himself as a Tao. So the Church has adopted the Tao as the official symbol of the Holy Spirit. However, the Holy Spirit just chooses to manifest himself the way he pleases. On the day of Pentecost, he came from heaven like a strong wind, and manifested himself as tongues of fire that filled the house and rested on the heads of the people who had gathered there. Moreover, the Holy Spirit did not come gently and quietly, but suddenly and unexpectedly. The text does not say whether they had prayed for the coming of the Holy Spirit. It appears that it came upon them of his own free will. He came because Jesus had told the apostles that he would ask God the Father to send the Holy Spirit to all who keep his commandments. Of course, the test of the apostles' obedience to Jesus' commandment came when he instructed them before his ascension not to leave Jerusalem but to stay together and wait. The apostles subsequently returned to Jerusalem and their staying together until the day of Pentecost imply they had responded obediently to Jesus' instructions. So, the Holy Spirit came upon them just as Jesus had promised. Consequently, the apostles were given the miraculous gift of speaking in tongues, that is, being able to speak in foreign languages which they had never learned. And at the same time, the crowds were able to hear the apostles in their own languages and thus understood the message of God. Friends, some might wonder how it was possible for the people to understand the apostles when they spoke in tongues. 
as Jesus said, all things are possible for one who believes. He does not mean that God is going to give us anything we want because we believe. It rather means that if we believe, then God can do anything in our life according to his plan and his purpose and his will. So, it is quite possible that on the day of Pentecost, God the Father, who had already given the gift of his Son Jesus, also gave the gift of the Holy Spirit and further gifts for his children, known as the gifts of the Holy Spirit. The gifts of the Spirit, as prophesied by Isaiah, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, counsel, fortitude, knowledge, piety and fear of the Lord were given to all those who truly believed in the power of God so that the apostles could proclaim the gospel in diverse languages and the people could understand the gospel in their own languages. All these were the work of the one and the same Spirit who gave to each believer as he determined. Friends, what is the message for us? God gives each and every believer in Christ the same gift, that is, the gift of the Holy Spirit, as he had given to the people who had assembled on the first Pentecost day. We, both infants and adults, first receive the Holy Spirit at baptism for the remission of original sin and are sealed with the Holy Spirit at confirmation. And the Holy Spirit takes up permanent residence in us to help us in every conceivable way. He will be with us, says Jesus, forever. However, while the Holy Spirit will never abandon us, it is possible for our sins to quench the Holy Spirit or grieve the Holy Spirit. Friends, our sins always affect our relationship with God. While our relationship with God is secure through faith in Jesus Christ, being unwilling to acknowledge our sins before God and perhaps to confess it to someone else can hinder our relationship with God and effectively bar the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Therefore, it is very important that we confess our sins because God is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all our wickedness. Otherwise, although the Holy Spirit will never abandon us, the spiritual powers of the gifts of the Spirit, wisdom, understanding, counsel, fortitude, knowledge, piety and the fear of the Lord, which we receive through Him for our own benefit, may not be active in us. These gifts are to help us to learn and know the truths of the Gospel, which will guide us back to our Heavenly Father. But if we disregard the gifts of the Holy Spirit, we will certainly lose the benefits of what God had meant them to do. The Apostle Paul goes still further and says, Whoever does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to Christ. Hence, first of all, let us reverently try to understand what happened on the day of Pentecost and believe in the power of the Spirit. Secondly, let us each day renew ourselves and allow God's Holy Spirit to fill us and drive away our pride and help us to seek forgiveness for our sins so that we can bear witness to His name in the world. Thirdly, let us meekly call upon the Holy Spirit to bless us with His gifts, the gift of wisdom, counsel, fortitude, knowledge, understanding, piety and the fear of the Lord. Fourthly, let us remember that without these gifts, we will not be docile to the promptings of the Holy Spirit. Without these gifts, we cannot bear fruits of the Spirit, such as charity, joy, peace, patience, kindness, fidelity, gentleness and self-control. And without these gifts, there can be no sanctification and salvation. Amen. God bless you.